You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another 100 meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. My brother in law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10 year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called Select Quote. Select Quote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 117, The September Campaign, Part 9, Army, Pomortia. This week, a big thank you goes out to Matt and Rich for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can become a member as well by heading over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. This episode will focus, as the title suggests, on Army, Pomortia. In my opinion, This army, out of all the Polish armies, was in the worst position at the start of the invasion. If you think about the Polish corridor as a thumb that stuck up from the the main area of Poland and then touched the the Baltic Sea, Army Pomorsia was positioned between the knuckle and the base of the thumb. In this position, they were completely exposed to attacks from both directions, from northern Germany and from East Prussia. And there was also the possibility that they would be surrounded and destroyed without being able to retreat south and east towards Warsaw. Most of Army Pomorsia's strength was also positioned northwest of the Vistula River, which made it critical that bridges over the river be held and protected to keep open that line of retreat. Army Pomorsia would pay the price in blood to the political need to defend the corridor. The army would be commanded by General Bartnowski, and due to the threats from both the east and west, he had set up his forces to cover from both directions. Two infantry divisions would be positioned to intercept any advance by the German 4th Army from the west, and two divisions would be placed to intercept any advance out of East Prussia to the east. Arranged against Army Pomorsia was the primary strength of Army Group North under the command of General Bach. In the west, the German attack would be launched with four infantry divisions, two motorized divisions, and one armored division of General Klug's 4th Army. From the east, the German advance would be made by two infantry divisions of General Klucker's 3rd Army, who we discussed last episode due to the majority of his forces being sent against Army Modlin to the south. Included in this attack would be the German 19th Motorized Army Corps, commanded by General Heinz Guderian, which we will be discussing many times over the coming years. Guderian's forces here are notable because they would be the primary armored formation assigned to the attack against Army Pomorsia, and the motorized corps would contain over 50,000 men, over 8,700 motor vehicles, and 530 armored vehicles of various types. All of the German divisions assigned to the attack gave them a, a crushing numerical advantage over the Polish defenders. And when you combine that with the two-front nature of the attack, Bortnowski and the rest of the army's leadership knew that a lengthy defense was probably not going to be possible. This was due not just to the position of the army, but also the amount of total frontage that had to be defended. 
This resulted in situations where infantry divisions were defending almost 50 kilometers worth of front when they should have been defending less than 20. There were also large gaps between some Polish units, not because the Polish officers thought that that was a good idea, but simply because of the number of troops that were available. Instead, they planned to fight a kind of fighting retreat instead of trying to hold at the border, with the goal of buying a little time to the west of the Vistula River before retreating behind the river and using it as a defensive anchor upon which greater defense against the German attackers could be mounted. Army Group North would begin their advance at the scheduled time of 4.45 a.m. on September 1st, but when they reached the border, they would encounter no resistance. Instead of placing troops right on the border, the Polish defensive positions were about 10 kilometers back, but they had made a mistake in not posting any troops close to the border. This meant that when the Germans did cross, they not just encountered no resistance, but the Polish forces did not even necessarily know that it was happening. For the advancing Germans, there were some surprises in store once they were in Polish territory. One soldier would find that the local population was far from hostile, with many villages near the border populated by ethnic Germans who 20 years earlier would have lived in Germany. There were other soldiers who would, in their accounts of their actions, let racism slip into their writings a little bit. One of the common ways that this was expressed, and would be for all of Germany's Eastern European campaigns, was through characterizing Polish villages and towns as dirty or unclean, with one soldier noting that the streets of one village seemed narrow and extremely dirty. This type of characterization was a powerful way to other the, the Polish people, and also to put them in a, a somewhere below where the Germans were at, calling into question not just the individuals, but their society as a whole, and comparing it to how German villages might be laid out and taken care of, or more often how German villages were idealized within the minds of the soldiers. If you want to really sort of read a little bit more on this idea, I highly recommend Warland on the Eastern Front, which is a look at the German occupation of Eastern Europe during the First World War. But it's a really good investigation into how German society viewed the cultures of Eastern Europe, and it still held true in 1939. In fact, it was probably sort of amplified in 1939. I discussed the book uh, during two occupation episodes for History of the Great War that you can find on that podcast feed under the title uh, Patreon Episode 15 and 16. They'll be near the top of the episode list. Another idea that gets mentioned in soldiers' accounts are, of course, the names of the places that they were moving through, with the German officer Fritz Phillies saying, quote, Now the unpronounceable names had begun. One man pronounced it one way, the next man pronounced it another, but they all meant the same thing. I feel like having challenges pronouncing local place names is one of the great unifying experiences of all soldiers moving into strange lands, and sometimes also podcasters <laughs> talking about places they've never talked about before. There were a wide range of experiences had by the German troops as they crossed the border in this area, but for most of them it did not involve Polish resistance, and in fact for some it would be five hours before they sort of encountered any Polish resistance at all. Although they did not know that they would have to wait that long or they would have to march that far, mostly due to the fact that in this area, the thick fog that we discussed in episode 115 would be the most impactful. It prevented any serious support for the advancing troops by the Luftwaffe, and it also made artillery support very challenging because it was so hard to see where shells were landing. When the two forces did finally meet, the same type of problems that the German advance was having against Army Maudlin would also be present. One of the decisions that was made for the 3rd Panzer Division was to have the advance led not by reconnaissance units, but instead tanks. This mistake contributed to the fact that when the forward elements of the 6th Panzer Regiment encountered an outpost of the Polish 34th Infantry Regiment, two Panzer II tanks were quickly destroyed by one Polish 37mm anti-tank gun. After these losses, the advance was halted while artillery was used to neutralize the Polish position so that the advance could continue. This same template of events would occur on several areas of the front. For example, in another area, a separate company of the 34th Regiment would take up positions on a railway embankment near the town of Prusch. This was a great position, because if the Germans wanted to continue their advance, they had to pass through two underpasses, which went under the railway embankment, which would be defended by more Polish anti-tank guns. A Panzer IV tank would be destroyed when it tried its luck moving forward, for example, and, and then other tanks would also attempt it. These positions would be held for two hours, while the Germans brought up greater numbers of troops and equipment and eventually just overwhelmed the Polish defenders. This allowed the 5th Panzer Regiment to reach the Burdau River. 
This river was important because it ran north to south and directly across the German path of advance. Recognizing its importance, the retreating Polish troops would try to burn the bridges over the river at Prusz with some success. Later in the evening, the Germans would be able to cross the Berta River at Prusz using rubber boats to launch an assault, but it still delayed them until 6 p.m. when the crossing was finally made. Further north, near the town of Tuhla, Polish defenders would have even greater success. The Polish 35th Infantry Regiment had been able to construct a strong series of positions near Tuhla, which they named the Rydal Position. This included trenches, barbed wire, and concrete machine gun nests. It was defended by about 3,300 Polish troops, although they were basically entirely reservists. They, they did at least, though, have strong defensive positions to defend and, and to help them. They were facing the German 2nd Infantry Division. Three regiments of, of the 2nd Infantry would be used to attack the Polish positions just a bit before noon on September 1st, and it went very poorly. The German attack would be a frontal assault against a very prepared position of very prepared Polish defenders, and the results would go may, uh, maybe how you would expect. Heavy German casualties, no real gains. The attacks of the same style would continue for the next six hours before the Polish defenders would be ordered to retreat, not because of the actions of the Germans in front of them, but due to the gains of the German forces to the south. Further north again, near the town of Honice, the Polish defenders would be slightly less successful, holding off the 20th Motorized Infantry Division only until about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. But in this area, the German forces would use their greater numbers and greater mobility to sort of help them instead of just running headlong into the Polish machine guns. They instead moved around Polish defenses to threaten an encirclement, forcing the Poles to abandon their positions and join other units retreating southeast. North of Hunice, one of the most famous or infamous events of the Polish campaign would take place near the town of ooh. North of Honice, one of the most famous events of the Polish campaign would take place near the village of Kroyanta. It is very possible that you have heard about what takes place near this village, even if you haven't heard of the village itself, because this is where the story of the Polish cavalry charging German tanks with their lances and sabers comes from. Cavalry and tanks would be involved in what would happen, but the rest of the story is a complete fabrication by Nazi propaganda. Kroyanta was a village to the northeast of Honice, and when it was clear that the Polish troops were going to need to abandon the area, two squadrons of the 18th Pomeranian Cavalry Regiment were sent forward to slow the German advance. This was a completely normal thing for Polish cavalry to do. They basically fought as uh, mounted infantry most of the time, and they were able to use their increased mobility to move field guns and anti-tank rifles and machine guns around the battlefield to quickly react to German actions. When the cavalry moved forward, what they found was a unit of German infantry, the 76th Infantry Regiment, who were not prepared for any kind of Polish assault. To try and take advantage of this situation, the Polish colonel in charge of the cavalry would lead 200 cavalry troops on a charge into the infantry. The charge was a complete success, scattering the German infantry and causing them to retreat in disorder. As might be expected, with several hundred cavalrymen charging at unprepared units of infantry, uh, they tried to get out of there as quickly as possible. At the moment of Polish success, several German armored vehicles appeared and opened fire on the cavalry. I believe they were armored cars. And the cavalry very quickly began their own retreat. Before they were able to break contact between the, a third and a half that the Polish cavalry would be killed. Overall, it would not end up being a success, and it would be a costly move for the cavalry units involved. But it did achieve what the cavalry had been sent to achieve. Delay a possible German advance. But the important part of the story is simply that the initial charge was not some suicidal, idiotic dash of um, against German tanks by men with, with sabers, and they were, they were beating on them with their sabers or something. It was a risky, but, you know, somewhat successful attack on an unsuspecting group of German infantry. It is unfortunate that the German propaganda version of these events has become the most well-known, because German propaganda was not exactly known for telling the truth. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. 
Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. At the same time as the attacks from the west were hitting the Pomorsha army, from the east, other attacks were about to begin. The operation in the east would start with an attempt being made to quickly capture some bridges over the Vistula River, near the town of Chef. To accomplish this, the German 41st Pioneer Battalion would use a bit of trickery, dressing up as Polish railway workers on a civilian train, while hiding most of the battalion within the rest of the train. There would also be a German armored train following behind with another pioneer battalion to assist once the assault began. This attempt, as inventive as it was, would be completely unsuccessful. The Polish defenders would learn of the attempt and would stop the train short of the bridges. This allowed the Polish 2nd Rifle Battalion to mount a defense long enough for the first bridge to be blown just after 6 a.m., while the other bridge would be dropped about 40 minutes later. This action was really important to the overall flow of the German advance out of East Prussia, because without those two bridges, the only option available was to stay on the eastern side of the Vistula River, instead of being able to advance down both sides. Regardless of which side of the river they were operating on, the German forces were aiming to capture the city of Grudjads, which was also on the Vistula, with the hope being that it would be near that city that they would meet up with the German troops advancing from the west. The city was defended by the Polish 16th Infantry Division, which was guarding a 22-kilometer sector facing north and east. For the majority of the day, the defenders would do quite well, before they were outflanked due to a German force being able to move across the Ossa River on the 16th's left flank. The crossing, accomplished at 6 p.m. by the 24th Infantry Regiment, would unhinge the entire Polish position. By the evening of September 1st, all along the Polish front, units were moving away from the positions in which they had started the war, with most of them moving generally south and east to escape the ongoing German attack. But the day had not gone completely poorly for the Polish defenders. As we've covered in this episode, there were several instances where the Polish defenders were able to stop German attacks, or at the very least delay them by several hours. The Polish anti-tank weapons worked well, and their defensive techniques were also working well. The problem was that so many of the Polish positions were too isolated, with so many instances where a unit would perform very well, but then be forced to retreat due to German movements on the flanks. I like this summary from Robert Forsyth's Case White, The Invasion of Poland, 1939. Quote, In general, the Polish defense of strong points had been tenacious, but inter-unit coordination was extremely poor. Each Polish regiment was essentially fighting its own independent war. End quote. For the German attackers, there were also many problems experienced during their first day of real combat in Poland. In some cases, the German units had been too aggressive, with leading with armored units without proper reconnaissance or attacking directly into Polish defenses. This caused far greater losses than what was really necessary if the German units had used their greater numbers and mobility to its greatest benefit by moving around and behind many Polish strongpoints. This would be one of the most important lessons that many militaries during the war would be forced to learn. 
The firm resistance of the Polish units would also have an effect on the German soldiers, with one German infantryman writing of, of one of the firefights he was in that day, quote, We reached the cemetery and jumped like rabbits between the gravestones. One salvo after another rained down. The first moans from the wounded were heard. Whoever entered into this war with enthusiasm would at this moment get goosebumps. I will never forget how I found a comrade by the side of the road with his chest torn open. He was still conscious, and, and one could see his heart beating. He didn't last the day. End quote. Regardless of the horrors that may have been experienced on September 1st, on September 2nd, there were a few attempts by Polish units to launch counterattacks to slow the German advance. For example, the 16th Infantry Division would try to kick the Germans back across the Ossa River near Grudziosz. Unfortunately for the Polish troops involved in these efforts, they were almost universally failures. They lacked the coordination and the simple numbers to really achieve their desired result of halting the German advance. The only real positive to the counterattacks is that it did at least slow the German attack a little, and it did prevent the German armored units from crossing the Vistula, which was important. This would buy at least a little time for the Polish units who had been retreating to, to reach crossing points over the river, or simply retreating south of, of the river and into more central Poland. On September 3rd, this retreat would be continuing everywhere, and Polish formations were, were getting strung out and completely disorganized, almost by the hour. There was also the problem of civilians that were also trying to move in the same direction as the military units, which caused big traffic problems on many of the roads in the area, something that a lot of militaries over the next five years would become very accustomed to. The Germans were at the same time trying to cut off the retreat of as many Polish units as possible, with some units continuing to race to the Vistula as quickly as they could, while others were positioned wherever possible to halt the Polish retreat. This resulted in a confusing mix of small little actions all over the front that were not really connected in any meaningful way beyond Polish troops attempting to survive and retreat, while German troops tried to stop them from continuing to, to do either of those things. In some cases, the Polish defenders would experience short-term successes during this period, with instances where a Polish unit would be able to destroy a few enemy tanks or hold off an infantry attack or, or other such events. But the outcome was often the same. The unit would be surrounded and then ground down to nothing, either due to men being killed or surrendering. That same type of story would happen countless times all along the front, with the only real unifying feature being confusion and desperation. Thousands of Polish prisoners would be captured on September 3rd, with the 19th German Corps alone capturing 4,000 west of the Vistula. Some Polish units that were on the western side of the river would manage to escape, for example the 35th Infantry Regiment and the 16th Uhlans, but they were certainly the exception. And even those units that did escape often suffered serious losses and were completely disorganized. On the eastern bank, the 16th Infantry would do a, a little better, and would continue to defend Grudziosz uh, throughout the day. The Germans were slowly grinding forward, though, using their advantages in artillery and armor to grind through the Polish defenses. Eventually, the 16th would decide to blow up the bridge over the river and join the retreat to the south. By midday on September 3rd, there were two grim realities for the Pomorsha army. The first was that the 9th and 27th Divisions essentially had ceased to exist as effective combat units, with very few of their original units having made it far enough south to avoid encirclement. And the second reality was that the two German armies had finally met across the Vistula before meeting fully the next day. What was left of the Pomorsha army that had been on the western side of the Vistula would concentrate around the city of Bidgoshk, which was defended by the 15th Infantry Division. In their retreat through the city, some ethnic Germans who had been given weapons by Abwehr agents before the start of the war took the opportunity to begin firing at the retreating Polish troops, killing 20 Polish soldiers. This would be answered by 100 ethnic Germans being killed and another 600 arrested, but as was so often the case, it did not end there. By September 4th, with the Polish retreat continuing, further clashes would take place with ethnic German civilians, reaching the point where, if you were an ethnic German and you lived anywhere near one of the shootings, you were in serious danger. Up to another 150 Germans would be killed by Polish soldiers and civilians during the 4th of September. 
On the night of September 4th, the order would be given for all Polish troops to abandon the city and continue on their way south and east, which then resulted in further killings of civilians when German troops of the 50th Infantry Division arrived and turned the tables on the now defenseless Polish citizens. Overall, German losses in their attacks on Army Pomorsia were not very high, and they completely accomplished their goal in about four days. The Polish forces were destroyed or in retreat, and the corridor was once again in German hands. For the Polish army, the results were kind of an expected disaster. It had been known from the beginning that Army Pomorsia was in a bad place and was at risk of destruction, but the hope was that it would be able to delay the German advance and cause some serious German casualties, but unfortunately it would do little of both. General Bortnowski, the commander of Army Pomorsia, would write to Polish High Command that, quote, The situation is that all the troops that have been cut off can now be considered lost. All that is left of the 27th Division is the division commander, about three infantry battalions, and five batteries. Of the 9th Division, only an incomplete 22nd Regiment and one battery. Something might still come up, but the bridgehead over the Vistula was destroyed at half past six this morning, and in the current situation it seems to me impossible. This is the state of things. End quote. I hope you will join me next episode as we continue to discuss the first few days of the German invasion by shifting our focus a little bit to the south to cover the largest German attack, which would be made against three Polish armies, Poznan, Lodz, and Krakow. <laughs>